everybody. It's Mike O'Geeky with the Mike O'Geeky podcast. Uh, it's Monday, the 26th. Got my dates right this week. This week, we are going to be talking with Gary Hefferly of Fresh from the Farm Fungi uh, about his business. Um, I don't know if you guys wa uh, watch this guy's YouTube videos or follow his business, but he is slowly and steadily building a fantastic mushroom farm business. And we're going to talk about uh, the ins and outs of that. We're going to talk about some of the things that matter to him. Um, some of the things he's, you know, trying to do right and the things he's trying to avoid so that uh, he can scale up his business slowly and steadily. And if you guys follow him on Instagram, you've seen this massive concrete slab. Um, he's got a new uh, building that's being erected currently uh, in the outskirts of Denver. Anyway, so uh, I also want to give a shout out. One of my buddies uh, runs a little Discord called uh, The Mushroom, The Magic Mushroom Speaks. Uh, he, he goes by the name Traveling Psychonaut. He's a crazy Canadian, real nice guy, a newer grower, but has an absolutely fun, cool Discord. Anybody that's new to Discord and wants to see how fun Discord can be, uh, be sure to check out his, uh, his Discord. I'll, I'll put a link in the description uh, probably tomorrow morning. But anyway, he sent me this cool shirt. Let me get this uh, mic out of the way so you can see it. The Magic Mushroom Speaks. Anyway, he's a cool guy, uh, and I appreciated he sent me a T-shirt. So I'm running out of a Hawaiian shirt, so I figured I'd put it on today. Anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to bring on the one and only YouTube ce micro celebrity, Gary Hefferly. Welcome, brother. Welcome. Thank you for uh, having me on, and I'm ready to talk mushrooms. Cool, man. Well, so... Uh, as a little background, we tried to do this uh, a couple months ago, and we had some little technical difficulties. So I'm glad we finally made this happen. Um, but you gave me a little little glimpse into what was going on. So let's just start with um, your background, how you got into growing mushrooms, how, when like your first mushroom memory was, um, and, and then when the that first seed was planted of like, I want to grow these and how that transitioned into, I want to try to make a living growing these. All right. So I can take it way back, I guess, to my formal education. Um, so I went to the state university of New York at Buffalo. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. And I met my wife who we, now we live in Denver. Um, back in college. So I went to Geneseo State College for a couple of years, and then I transferred to UB when I discovered that they had a medical technology program. So I had an interest in medicine, um, and I really enjoyed lab work. You know, when I was uh, in school, we would do like four-hour labs, and um, by the time I finished, um, we had to do a bunch of clinical rotations. So I, I remember having an interest mostly in like microscopy. So I started off in microbiology, like clinical microbiology. So I did rotations at a few different hospitals when I was in college. And we did um, some karyotype sure, uh, yeah. work when I was at the Buffalo General Hospital. And I really enjoyed like the process of lysing the cells and then we would uh, make karyotypes with stains and try to match uh, different genes. And it was very interesting. And, you know, that kind of sparked my interest in microscopy. And then I did take a few semesters of clinical mycology. So that was more like, um, like pathogenic fungi that they would enter the body and you would do different testing. Sorry, my cat is going crazy over there. But okay. um, she loves yeah. the podcast. I get it. <laughs> so I learned a lot of the basics as far as, you know, aseptic technique, yeah. um, working in a flow hood, working at BSL three labs. And I started to work in a blood bank in Buffalo. But I quickly realized I didn't really enjoy like the uh, the hospital like atmosphere is pretty fast paced. And I would have had to start off on overnights. So uh, my wife and I, we took a road trip all across the country. Uh, I used to have a, a Jeep Wrangler and we went with a friend of ours from college 
and we just camped out, you know, from New York. We went through Ohio. Um, and then I'm sorry. We went, I'm sorry. <laughs> we went um, we tried. stayed at the Badlands for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the Redwoods and up in Oregon and down the coast. And we stayed at the Grand Canyon. And then we ended up in Colorado for a few nights um, in Glenwood Springs. And we fell in love with it here. So I put out a bunch of resumes to there is a, a human tissue culture facility and they were procuring stem cells. It was called Allosource. So it's pretty, you know, state of the art lab and they were working with stem cells and they happened to be connected with the blood bank that I was working in Buffalo. So I ended up getting a job there. Nice. And we were making heart stints out of stem cells. And that really brought to light, like the importance of aseptic technique. Like we would wear full body suits oh, yeah. and I did a lot of quality control testing and we would procure the cells and then test for their viability. So we did a lot of liquid culture and um, I was exposed to that. And during the so liquid time, culture for stem cells. Yeah. So for okay. human cells, um, they're like these little square containers and they'd be on rockers and basically mm -hmm. it would attach itself to like a, like a silicone scaffolding. And then it would form these different sized tubes mm -hmm. so that when surgeons would perform heart surgery, they wouldn't have to take a, a an artery out of their leg right. and they could just use these stints instead. And then it saved, um, you know, recovery time and there's all these benefits and it was a really cool product, but eventually, um, the FDA had some, some issues and, you know, the regulations are always changing. So it's a tough industry. And my boss at the time, he moved away. Um, so I like decided to, um, you know, I would have had to do a different department and totally broke up our team and, it was at that moment that cannabis became legal in Colorado. So I decided to jump on that train and I worked at a, a, a cannabis cultivation facility and we had a tissue culture lab. So I bred about 80 different strains using plant tissue culture, which if anyone knows, that is very similar to growing mushrooms. Right. And that was probably seven ish years ago. Um, and I did that project for like eight or nine months. And I also uh, worked in the cultivation side of things. So it was really cool to see this brand new startup company. They got all this funding and they were building these like state of the art labs and grow rooms. And I, I was, you know, probably the 20, 30th employee. And by the time I left, there was, you know, hundreds of people wow. at this company. So seeing that growth happen got me really excited and like the entrepreneurship side of just like, I never considered, you know, having a business or I, I always thought I'd just work in a hospital and, you know, collect the paycheck, but um, it became pretty mundane. So I jumped into this world of like the cannabis world. And um, after that, they, you know, we bred all these different strains and they kind of closed that department. And then they offered me a, a cultivation job, but instead I took my lab skills and I worked for a company that was testing products. So we worked with the CDPHE, which is like the oversight um, department of health okay. in Colorado. And we would test different cannabis products for safety and potency before it got into the shelves. Right. So I did that for a couple of years and I developed a lab from, you know, um, at first we were taking six or eight samples a day and then we had to scale up to like a hundred samples. And then by the time I left, they were getting hundreds of samples to test. So once again, and this I was all part of the movement of mm -hmm. as it became legal and as there's more dispensaries and as people, more people are moving into the space, especially people that might have a higher standard of expectation for the product, the demand then to test for different uh, amounts of X, Y, and Z became more important. I'm, I'm assuming. Is yep. And at the time they were redlining these regulations 
like monthly. So there would be amendments to, you know, the, the law all the time because there's a committee that was like adjusting constantly. So at first, you know, you only had to batch test X amount per pound, but then they found people cutting corners. So they would adjust it to, you know, you have to do this uh, testing up front that was more stringent. And then when that passed, then you could dial it back. And then they were figuring out trace amounts of chemicals that people were using, like this Eagle 20 in the beginning was super common. And then they had to outlaw it because they figured out, you know, the Wait a minute. Out. They outlawed something called Eagle. Yeah. Eagles yeah. are good. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I mean, there's things from, you had to have complete video coverage of your grow at one point. Wow. So there were smaller companies that went under because they w weren't able to keep up with all these changes and like the, cost. the, yeah, the cost and, you know, just the cost for the licensing and all that. But anyway, um, being on the other side of things, I got to see small scale grows, super large commercial grows. And we would go there because they would, you know, have some issues with uh, cleanliness and then we'd get to like test the facility for environmental, um, you know, contaminants. And that kind of developed my like global perspective on just uh, the cultivation process. So cannabis is super similar to mushrooms. There's, you know, the clone stage, which would be like the Petri dish stage and then the veg stage, which is like incubation and then flower is like fruiting. So it kind of is all hand in hand. And during this whole entire time, you know, when, when we moved out to Colorado and um, when I was working all those jobs, I've always kept a vegetable garden. Um, you can't really see it because it's pretty dark, but I'm a big plant person. And one summer, it was probably about seven or eight years ago, um, I just decided I'm going to grow some mushrooms. I think I was watching Lord of the Rings and, you know, when Sam and, and Mary and Pippin fall on those mushrooms, like I was just, I don't know, it was just a weird inspiration. I'm like, I'm going to grow mushrooms. So I bought these uh, little seed packets off of Amazon and it was like, Oh, you, you, you know, bought mushroom seeds. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. There it was like a package, like maybe two inches long by like an inch. And there was probably like 20 pieces of oat that was completely dried oh, out. Okay, okay. Maybe maybe it was a mushroom spawn at one point, but it was just completely dry. And I, I opened it up and I, I just put it in like a little uh, Tupperware with potting soil. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, vaguely researched it, um, maybe spent like an hour looking at the process. And I remember waiting for like, weeks and weeks and finally it started to get like a white film on top and I was all excited and then it was just pure trichoderma so I was just like crushed and then that oh. is when I went down deep down the rabbit hole because you know I, I wanted to grow mushrooms and um, I started you know looking up the differences between sap robes and secondary composers and you know the all the exotic mushrooms out there and um, I just did tons and tons of research and honestly, like the shroomery, um, it had a lot of different, you know, aseptic techniques and, you know, different, I remember reading PF tech and like, that was like mind blowing. Um, and some of my friends, you know, they were kind of into the psychedelic world. So they were talking to me about, you know, the shroomery and it was cool to talk to people because like my whole life I've been a scientist and all these words like aseptic technique and sterilizing and you know it's over a lot of people's head but then the people who are into growing mushrooms it it's it was just a way to connect um you so, had me at aseptic technique Gary yes yeah so um so a couple years went by and then I ended up buying this house. It was like a, a complete wreck. So part of my time that I don't spend growing mushrooms, um, I always do house projects and I've bought in like the worst property in the neighborhood and spent a couple of years just flipping them. 
And I've done this three or four times now. And um, at that time, this house was just in disrepair. And my wife and I, we lived in the basement for like six months. And I totally gutted the house. I, you know, redid the drywall, the flooring, all the electric. And, and then by the time we moved up, I had this space in the basement. And I was like, what am I going to do? So I had been gathering just lab equipment over the years like I have a little autoclave and I got a flow hood and an incubator and I would just pick up all these supplies just uh you know some of them are from like a like a college sellout and um I had enough stuff to start dabbling in mushrooms so um I found this that do you you understand the like you are the anomaly of that story (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I decided to get into mushrooms and then I went down in my basement and I'm, I was like, wow, look, look at my flow hood and my incubator and my warm water bath and my autoclave. And yeah, that you were, it yeah. was meant to be for you for sure. Absolutely. And most of the coincidence was because I was tissue culturing cannabis. So it's like the same equipment, like you still need an autoclave. And then we were growing them in baby jars so I was also, you know, really into uh, cultivating cannabis, and I still do that. Um, it's legal here in Denver. Right. So that side of the botany was kind of just like coalesced with the mushrooms. And I feel like the symbiosis between both of them is what drives my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of my ultimate big time dreams is to have my property in Sedalia so I guess so um abundant and you want to recreate that uh Lord of the Rings scene yes yeah and I want people to fly over Denver and see my property and it just be so green that they just are like what is that <laughs> like that right that is a that's my passion and I think that you know having a mushroom farm at the heart of my property will develop the soil which is very sparse and dry in Colorado but the sun is so abundant that it's easier to amend soil and irrigate than it is to produce more light so over the right. course of you know decades of mushroom farming i my dream is to expand our our farm into you know fruit trees and veggies and you know i want to grow a uh, like one of the great sequoia, like uh, the redwood trees in, mm-hmm. in my property. And I think that with the help of mushrooms, um, it can be done. So that's like my, my, uh, my project for this fall, which I'm starting to film, um, is a liquid culture technique. And it's always been uh, one of my crazy ideas to fill up a backpack sprayer with some liquid culture and just inoculate the hillside. And I just laid a whole roll of uh this erosion blanket which is all cocoa fiber Mm -hmm. and my plan is to take um a bluet mushroom that i cloned from telluride so i was delighted to meet alan rockefeller for the first time and on the way to this event i looked down and i found this beautiful purple lavender mushroom and it was it was something I hadn't heard or seen before. I've seen blue mushrooms, but they had larger stipes. So this one had a really thin stipe and like deep purple. So I picked it and brought it with me. And he said that it was an undescribed species. So I went back to my Airbnb and I had like this little homemade lab that I brought and I cloned it and it's growing out on auger. Um, So my plan is to expand that in the next couple of weeks and then just inoculate my hillside. And that will be like the indoctrination into this mushroom Mecca that I'm trying to build. So um, that's kind of like my, my global long-term vision and to reduce the footprint of my farm continuously uh, to make things more efficient and just to keep it small and, you know, local. Um, yeah. I just, I just love the, the community aspect. So that was kind of a long drawn out, you know, history of how it came to be. But once we moved out of my basement, 
that is when I started going hard into the hobby. So um, I found a, a grow kit on Craigslist. Actually, my wife did. It was a brown oyster mushroom. And it was just someone like, uh, there's this mushroom kit on my porch. Come take it away before I throw it out. <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I'm there. I'm going. And um, I set up this janky, like, plastic tarp. And it had I had, like, a little humidifier and a tiny little, like, LED light. And I just stuck the grow kit on this wire rack and after two or three days it started to pin, I was like, Oh my God. And then I got my first fruits and that was probably about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then that next summer um, I saved up all my money and I decided to quit that corporate job, um, the weed job. And then I started growing mushrooms full time and it was scary. I still had to keep a part time job um, for about four more months. I worked at a pizzeria, but that helps me kind of connect to the food world. And then um, and then you I, eventually sold them your mushrooms, right? For their pizzas. Not them. Oh, he was yeah. a hard sell. <laughs> um, but um, what happened was so I was growing in a four foot by four foot grow tent. Um, it was an old like cannabis tent that I converted and I had like a Martha set up and I was growing lion's mane mushrooms and I just posted a Craigslist ad and I was like, well, this was after my wife and I had been eating mushrooms for like three weeks straight. Um, mm -hmm. And then some guy in Lakewood, which is about 20 minutes north, uh, he rode his bike here and he, uh, you know, knocked on my door. I brought him this basket of lion's mane and he grabbed one like an apple and just ate it raw right in front of me. And I was just, I was like, oh my God, dude, you're supposed to like, cook that. He, <laughs> so after that happened, like, oh my God. I was like, there is a market for this. Oh yeah. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, that that was my first, I would say, sale to the public, which sure. is pretty crazy. But uh, I was hooked on it. And then um, about a week after that, I got a call from this girl, um, Christina, who she's the owner of Jovial Concepts. And they were opening a co-op grocery store. Okay. And she saw my ad on Craigslist. She's like, hey, we're looking for produce um, suppliers that are local and small and like w would you be interested in joining our co-op so that was another pivotal point in my in my story so um after that i really could focus on growing quantity because i knew i would have a place to sell them right so they opened up in october and i i've been growing mushrooms since like maybe march or april and then um i had to pick up that part-time job for the summer and then I remember Halloween being like, all right, I'm, I don't, I don't want to come in and I'm starting to grow mushrooms more and more. And then that I haven't looked back since that day. So that was about four years ago now um, where I've been doing this for full time. And part of my business is that it's seasonal. So I don't like to get burned out. Um, it gets really tough, especially this time of year. I've probably worked 28 days straight doing 10 hour days, um, just trying to prepare the new building, keeping up with production. And then now we have a, our first baby on the way. So there's oh, a lot congrats. of congrats. Well, thank you. Um, there's a lot of, you know, extra house things that I'm trying to, you know, pick up the slack and then maintain everything. And this is our first week where we're not going to be doing grains. So that freed up a couple hours and then um, I'll slowly dial my production back until November. I'm going to shut everything down and then slowly work on moving things to the new facility. And then our baby um, is expected to be born in December. So we're going to take a couple months off and just enjoy that and then come back full force in the springtime. So that brings us to present day. Um, there's a lot of a lot of failure, um, especially early on. I mean, just not having a 
a, a big sterilizer. I, I went a whole year just sterilizing on four or five little Presto pressure cookers. And um, I, I give my wife so much credit for uh, letting me just rattle the kitchen for like two years. <laughs> it's just like until I could afford a Bubba barrel. So we've never taken out, you know, any type of loan. It's just bootstrapped from the beginning and just uh, being very innovative and patient and you know all of our proceeds from our business just went back into the business and right. it's led us to this point where now we have a you know this 1500 square foot slab and my plan is to fruit mushrooms there next year so um, we're gonna keep our, our lab and I'll probably keep the grow just in case you know there's some hiccups but um, once we can do fruiting, then I'll slowly build in the lab portion. And I would really love to do some outdoor cultivation, like I said, with the blue it mushrooms. Um, but my other passion is just breeding. So I know you wanted to talk a little about that. And yeah, that's been the topic these days. So yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I don't know if you've seen anything people have been talking yep. about. Um, we have one of the resident uh, breeding experts uh, listening in. Uh, so I, you know, I think a lot of people want to hear if you have some some thoughts on breeding. Yeah. So for my my business, it fits in in the down season. So every winter um, since I've started, I've been taking my weakest strains and then running them through the, the gauntlet, I call it. So basically what I do is um, I'll take a spore print and fresh is best. So usually I'll wait till the end of the season. And then um, there's a few different ways that I like to do spore prints. I'll either do it on a sterile Petri dish, which is nice because you can make a spore solution very easily. Right. Um, or if I'm storing a lot of them, I'll do it on foil because it's, it, you can stack a lot of them in a small space and that's a good backup, you know, and usually fo foil is pretty sterile when it comes out of the roll yeah. or at least it's aseptic, um, not as dirty as like, you know, a, just a piece of glass somewhere. But then the other method, if I'm doing microscopy, I will do it on glass slide and then that way you can easily pull the spores sure. off of that too. So, so one of those methods, I'll, I'll start from spore and then my preferred method for variability is going to be a serial dilution. So there's a few reasons why I choose that. Um, if you do a spore swab, there's something called the Buller phenomenon, where the genetics that are most dominant are going to prevail in a tight little environment. So... You can dilute swab spores, though, um, and have isolates. It's just uh, it's not as guaranteed, in my opinion, as um, doing a serial dilution. So I like to add surfactants to my, my dilution as well. So that's like a Like soap. tween 20 and all yep. that, or jet dry. Yep, yep. So soap. tween yeah. is a good product. And um, there's a simple experiment you can do. So taking it back to my pizza days um one of my managers would make a joke about like uh these oregano in a in a bucket of water so if you take some oregano sprinkle it on water and then you add some dawn dish soap you'll watch them all oh, separate no. it's crazy and anyone could do that at home but that's the idea of using a surfactant in a spore solution it's going to create charges where the spores will separate more right. easily and the idea is that um, you will have haploid uh, monokaryonic spores. And when you're breeding mushrooms, um, each spore is half of the genetic material. So you can take one spore and cross it with another spore because they'll grow hyphae and then they'll fuse together. Um, that's the basic principle of breeding. So if you do it, in a very concentrated area, you won't have as much variability because the recessive traits won't have time to develop and they'll just get engulfed by whatever the standard trait is. So that's why people who, you know, stabilize genetics, you can just swab and swab over time and you'll get relatively 
the same genes. But if you use a serial dilution, which is taking a concentrated amount of spores and then taking a small drop of that or a small volume and then transferring it to a different tube that has sterile water and then subsequent dilutions are going to have less and less and less spores until you get to the point where in one tube you would ideally have one spore or one aliquot from that tube would, would have, have one, one spore. spore. And then you can take a stack of plates and then put one drop on every plate and then you just get one single spore. It's still not guaranteed because, you know, there could be two spores that clump together and then um, they would mate before you have a chance to isolate them. But that is probably the best way that I've, you know, found out how to retain some control. So mm. that's the whole. Now purpose. I have a question for you. So yeah. you're yep. saying, okay, so uh, the off season comes around. You're like, what mushroom am I the most pissed off about? You know, it's just <laughs> underperforming lazy ass mushroom strain. I'm going to yep. work that. So, but then you're saying, well, if I don't serial dilute, the strongest genetics will dominate. Is that bad though? I mean, or are you trying to find the lesser, you're trying to find like the quiet girl in the corner who like, maybe she's not going to make, you know, varsity uh, cheerleading squad, but maybe she is, you know, an undiscovered choreographer who's got something special to bring to the team. Right. So is that what you're looking for? Cause otherwise I'm sitting there going, well, if the most dominant uh, genetics win every time in a more traditional, um, you know, streak swabbing or, or some other technique, why is it so important to have a more randomized selection? So I'm just going for variability. Oh, variability. Uh, variability. Okay. So, you know, out of 10 trial runs, if I just ran a swab, nine out of 10 are going to be so similar that you wouldn't distinguish it. But if okay. you use a serial dilution and you do 10 random selected phenotypes and cross they will them all, be different. they're going to look way different. And then I you see. get to pick, it's like, you know, if that makes sense, like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, like dog breeds. You're going to get a Chihuahua and a Bulldog and a Golden Retriever instead of three retrievers that one's brown one's off brown and you know one's... or three annoying wiener dogs that are just <laughs> eating all your pizza yeah yeah I get it. yeah so more variability and you know okay. maybe that's not desired so if you are just seeking out fast strong traits maybe it's quicker and easier just to use four swabs and drop it on all a right, petri dish okay. and collect the sector and you know, that's I, I missed that point. But... You were saying for variability. Yep, yep. To give yourself more choices to really like, like when you go to Subway and, and you read it and it says they're sandwich artists. Mm -hmm. You're you're the micro artist. You want more options. You want yes, I get it. And yep. that that's a level of um, I think a lot of people, especially in the cube community might really just be overly driven by potency or you know contaminant resistance these are all obviously things that that you would want mm -hmm. but for gourmets and i for anybody that hasn't seen your instagram i mean your flushes look freaking amazing dude so it's obvious you care about those things and are looking to aesthetically improve the the look of the mushroom so okay i, I get it now yep yep okay. so i would equate it to like spreading out like a i don't know a, a wheel of colors and then you get right. pinpoint selection compared to just like brushing it with a paintbrush um so that's my philosophy mm -hmm. and you know i'm gonna be talking about ways to scale that up so that you know you can have that variability and you know the the efficiency that some of the other methods offer okay. um, i did do some some spore to liquid culture breeding last winter with a lot of success i really like that method so my future plan for this winter if anyone is interested um, i'm going to be doing like spores into solution 
but scaled down into these uh, 96 well plates so that you can have mini crosses all on the size of like one solid dish. So that will help, you know, reduce waste. It will be a lot more precise. So that's where pipette skills come into play, um, patience, and, you know, just a careful ASAP to technique. So you, you're getting your dilution down to where you can confidently assume per aliquot your, or per distribution of whatever quantity you're putting in there, you're getting one spore. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty consistent. There's a variation, but I, I think that I can validate like one spore or no spores. Mm -hmm. Like it would be one or zero, or I could go the dilution above, which would be one to 10 spores but you kind of want to push that line the other way. Right. Um, and yeah, there's ways to automate all of that, which mm-hmm. I'll be getting into that in the future as well. So um, you can literally put a spore in liquid culture. I'm assuming you're going to put two or yep. are you just one, doing well, one? One on one, one on one, make okay. sure they're viable because you want to make sure that the spores germinate before you cross them in a vial because oh, right. yeah. you might have a monocarion. So you want them to, to germinate in their own well, and then you cross them systematically. So, right. Okay. Um, I get it. Yeah. So, even out of, you know, a hundred spores in their little own vials, it just depends on the viability. So, I think fresh spores are more viable. I think that the genetics starting are going to be a determining factor for viability. Like some right. mushrooms right out of the wild, they'll pop every spore, but some of the mushrooms that I've been breeding, you know, myself over the past, you know, few, few years, they'll start to degrade. And then you try to get spores out of those prints and less and less become viable. So, and see, that's interesting because people always talk about senescence Mm -hmm. from the point of view of just my, my agar plate transfers. But a lot of times when I think about it and I notice it, it seems to be, it, it isn't just that I'm transferring, because really, if you think about what's happening on the plate, right, you're letting a mycelial colony develop all these little hyphae, and then you're just going, nope, I'm going to just, you know, steal you from your native land, and now I'm going to put you somewhere else on another plate. And now it grows out again, but it sort of doesn't care. It's just going to restart its process again. And so it's, it's always doing this. And so I really just imagine like when I'm on my 12th or 30th transfer, it's really just like the equivalent of say, you know, a 30 foot mycelial bed somewhere. Right. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, but that's what mycelium does in nature anyway. Right. It can have a vast expanse of mycelium. So how am I getting senescence from that? But I'm thinking it has more to do with how it's isolated in the lab and how artificial some of our processes are. And by going back to spore and cycling through that, you, you're able to, to reinvigorate things to some degree, but obviously those wild spores, man, they come out of the gate swinging real hard because they're happy, right? They're, it's like the wild tiger versus the, the tiger that was born in captivity. And it's like, it's a tiger, right? But it's not it's not a real tiger that's just going to absolutely murder you the second it gets a chance to. So yeah, I, talk, yeah, I, I like think tigers. I can agree with some of that stuff. So my, uh, my thoughts on senescence are that there are many factors that can cause senescence. I think that the predominant factor is going to be mutations that are caused by DNA replication and failure to repair those mutations. So that could be caused by a number of things such as like physical, just physical factors like uh, UV radiation, like exposing mycelium to sunlight is there's a chance that this, you know, beam of light hits the perfect, you know, DNA part sends a a proton flying and then there's a mutation and then the self-correction mechanism in the cell of the the fungus is going to miss that and then that trait gets pa- passed on because you cut you cut a segment from that mycelium um there's some people that try to cause mutations by 
you know, absurd environment. So if you have right. low pHs on your plates or high pHs and there's, you know, different um, chemical reactions that can cause mutations that way, um, just the degradation of telomeres within the genetics of that mushroom, they can just, you know, have mutations just by replicating. So right. over and over and over. And there's different sections of like repeated patterns that are present in the genomes of filamentous fungi. And those repeated segments can vary from strain to strain. They can vary from in between different species. And I feel like those offer some protection to senescence. So I think that cordyceps, for example, has a very, you know, sensitive genome and that tends to senesce very quickly compared to like a, a brown oyster or a blue oyster that I can take transfers, I can clone from those fruiting bodies. And I feel like there's longer regions of these, you know, repeated unspecific sections of DNA, which are embedded into their genome, but I, I don't know enough about that. That's just what I'm assuming. But um, the same thing is present in like mammals and humans. And uh, I think it's there as a protection against mutations, but it's hard to say. Um, I think that the next level of breeding, which I don't think anyone's there yet, but maybe people are doing this. I know Alan Rockefeller is a leader in the, uh, the DNA sequencing. And if anyone out there is familiar with the cannabis industry, there's uh, this company in Oregon called Phylos, and they sequenced all of these different strains of weed, and it's called the Phylos Galaxy. I think that if there was something like that paralleled with mushrooms, that would be a great resource. And basically you enter this galaxy and you can click on like land race strains. So it'll go to like a ac cappella gold or whatever from Africa. And then you can see all of its predecessors and you click on one and it shows the genome so that, you know, you can validate that what you have that you're cultivating is actually related to this land race. So there is a genetic library being formed um, and it's open source uh, if, if anyone wants to learn more about this, Alan Rockefeller is like the father of this new age of cataloging mushrooms from the wild. And it's really simple. You just need a, a DNA extraction kit. And there's a few labs that you can just send your DNA and, right. you know, a hundred bucks or whatever. You can have your, your DNA sequenced. Um, so I feel like the revolution of that the open sourceness of like YouTube and then all of these labs that are starting to pop up like flourish labs, um, which if anyone's seen my latest video, I sent a freeze dried mycelium and a freeze dried fruiting body and a tincture of cordyceps that I made. Oh and yeah. He just I, got the standards to do all this testing, didn't he? Yeah. And he's yeah. expanding into uh, reishi. So ganodermic acids I'm sure that he can do potency of lots of different types of mushrooms and right. different alkaloids and the science is becoming more valuable. So, you know, as we breed, I feel like breeding with intention. So different potencies for different strains and, you know, different um, genetic makeup to validate that you're actually getting these strains. And I, I listened to one of your previous podcasts uh, about, um, smash tech and uh, ghetto squatting, yeah. and I'm I want to ask you to because I'm unfamiliar with those terms. But listening to that, I'm like, okay, well, if they sent these DNA extractions, then that would easily validate Correct. those techniques. Yeah. So, a question from me to you is like, um, so what is smash tech? What is uh, ghetto swabbing? And what are the principles behind those? Because I'm interested in that just from, you know, right. a you, gourmet perspective. You might already have done this, but so All the right. ghetto swab. So say you have two fruits, 
um, two different varieties. Uh, they're fruiting at the same time. And you go to swab them. You, you swab the gill of the, the one fruit. You take the very same swab, move it over to the other variety, swab that gill. Ideally, go back and forth a couple times. The idea is you're sort of overlaying um, mm -hmm. the different varieties of spores. And then you do a traditional uh, swab plate. Yep. Hoping that maybe, you, if you're lucky, when all these things start germinating and branching out and looking to, to make some connections, somewhere on that plate might be um, uh, an actual cross. Um, yeah, and it, I, it obviously works. Sense. People yeah. have done it for, for quite a while. Um, but the, the new thinking is that it's not consistent or it's hard to know unless just morphologically you can look at it and go, it seems like it's probably right. But you bring up a great point, which is you could technically spend the money on the DNA sequencing and likely prove, but you would probably also need the DNA sequencing of the parent fruits, I think, to compare it. So you'd have to do a few tests, but yep. it could be done. But it also, I mean, for the people who are doing that, I don't think that matters. I think they're looking for a certain look or maybe they're looking for the potency of one fruit and the vigor of another or a look from one and the potency of the other. So I, I think most of those people, if they get something that makes sense visually and it's stable, I, I think they're okay. I don't think they'll ever cross that line yep, into so, getting the, the testing done for it. But So something that I just thought of then, so earlier when I was listening to one of your podcasts, you were talking about when you bought a culture based on the pictures. So that is the phenotype, which is the physical expression right. of the genotype. So you're purchasing the genotype, right. but what should be the new standard, which I myself, I'm, I'm going to admit, I don't do this, but you should be, when you sell your culture, there should be temperature variance there should be co2 variance and lighting requirements because right. then you would be able to purchase that phenotype which is the physical expression of what right. you're buying um so that's gonna really push me now to take better measurements and that because people should be able to replicate exactly right. you know the pictures right. that you're buying and oh yeah you know, i mean there there are uh cube vendors who um, get just a spectacular fruit. And then that is just the picture that they use to sell all mm -hmm. their genetics. And I mean, uh, one example is a variety called Starry Night. I mean, I, I think I've seen just two or three people ever be able to even remotely replicate sort of the original Starry Night images that made people go, wow, that cap looks literally like, you know, the sky. It's amazing. So I, I, 100%, the, the more as a vendor you can ensure um, this is what your garbage pail kid looks like, you know, and, and when you grow your garbage pail kid, you're going to get Adam Bomb. That's that's what everybody wants, for sure. Yeah, I feel like that it could be done, but there needs to be more science behind it. Correct. Um, but also, I understand the marketing. <laughs> it's a... Yeah, the, yeah, I think for... so. Obviously, taste is a quality that doesn't come into play so much for medicinals and mm -hmm. actives. But for gourmets, I mean, for me personally, taste is king. Yeah. The first time I taste, the first time I fruited a shiitake block, and I had absolutely like I plucked those suckers and I they were in a pan within minutes. I mean, it was like life changing what that flavor profile was mm -hmm. compared to shiitake that I'm buying at the grocery store. There's like no comparing it. So, so you're, when you're growing gourmets, there's different parameters that you're working for, not just looks. Looks definitely get people to buy them, but, but the flavor versus, I feel like flavor is the potency of gourmets. Absolutely. And you have some control on the flavor. Um, so first off, just different substrates. At, at the very beginning, I was I befriended a, a woodworker who he would make these natural wooden slabs out of all these exotic woods. So he yep. would order like these huge slabs from South America and it would be like this rare hardwood. Like Bubinga. Yeah. yeah. And then I would Zebra grow, wood. 
I would grow some chestnuts on that. And then the next round was just an oak from the middle of, you know, Idaho or something. And then I would get the sawdust for, yeah, Ohio, Mm -hmm. uh, some, (laughs) some maple trees or something. But then, yeah, I learned to, I learned that it actually does procure different flavors. So I'm sure it does. There is a depth you can go. And I was doing that, but the problem was that it wasn't consistent enough. So I ended up switching over to wooden pellets about maybe two years ago. Um, And I, I use mushroom media. So he procures his oak pellets from the Amish. Um, At least some, some of the sourcing is from that. So it's very consistent. Um, They have like a, a larger like particle size. So I get better yields, um, but I've also experimented recently with doing some scrub oak from my own property. Mm-hmm. So part of my my vision is to be you know vertically integrated, and I don't know if that will ever happen. But it's cool to cut those pellets with some wood chips from my property, and it has like this different depth of flavor. And the 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 scrub oak that I'm using is fresh, so it's like I chopped it up and then maybe five, six days later, I'm bagging it and putting it through the sterilizer. And it definitely has a difference in flavor. And also just the period of time where you pick. So like I was talking about with yields earlier, um, if you pick mushrooms at different phases, they're going to have different potencies of flavor. Lion's mane, especially some people will pick lion's mane way too early and it's really dense and bitter and I think as you develop it over time, it creates a more round flavor. Um, but then chestnuts, on the other hand, I like to pick them like right as the caps open. And that way they have like this, uh, I don't know, it's almost like a juiciness to them. But inside that is a lot more flavor than if I let them go too long. It almost gets like a funk, like almost like a yeasty flavor. So I think that, there are differences that you can control as a cultivator, but when you're growing 5,000 pounds of shiitake a week, you just got to pick them. <laughs> so. yeah. and, and you need reliable. And I know the hardwood pellet manufacturers are sourcing pretty consistently the same hardwood yep. scraps or where whatever they're. Yeah. I don't think the, I think the variation is pretty subtle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, maybe as time goes on, I will be able to procure different flavors. But the phase that I'm at in my business is I'm trying to scale consistently. Right. And I'm trying to establish like this next level of client where they're buying 30, 50 pounds a week consistently. Right. And, you know, they want the same mushroom over and over where farmers market people, you know, they want variety and they want the best of the best. So I've served them this whole entire time. And I think that that pushes me to be a better grower. Um, and then, yeah, I, I feel yeah, like. I, ma- I imagine the restaurants, they want very a very consistent product. Like yeah. they, they Because they get used to, you know, they're dicing it a certain way and they're cooking it for a certain amount of time. And if you start switching up texture, weight, uh, all size, fruit size, all that stuff could potentially throw them. Yeah. Yep. A little bit. Yep. So it's just finding the right person. And, you know, that's just a matter of networking and just uh, longevity. Like a lot of people I've seen who don't make it, they come right out the gates and they grow way too many mushrooms. And then three months later, they burn all this capital because they don't have a buyer. And then maybe they'll last a few more months because they'll dial it back. But right. that's the number one mistake is just going too big, too hard. And it's, you know, I've been there right in the beginning and I've lost 200 pounds of substrate to contamination and right. it's devastating. But, you know, if you're innovative enough and you don't take out a loan and you don't start cutting corners, then it's just part of learning. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I feel like flavors are, are procured and that's like a whole new level of right. growing mushrooms. And I'm sure that you can procure different flavors 
with other medicinal mushrooms too. It's just not even like a uh, consideration by the consumer. So ultimately the market decides market here in Denver loves high quality, um, loves flavorful and it loves uh, knowing, you know, who you're actually buying your mushrooms from. And, you know, my, my ultimate like excitement for this new facility is that I'll be able to have tours. So that's kind of my goal is like have people come visit, come walk through the, the fruiting rooms. And um, I'm really excited just to show people and educate people. And um, yeah, it's just yeah, so, a, a great time to have a mushroom business. So you sort of touched on it, uh, which is the relationship, the farmer's market customer that comes and talks to you every week. And, and uh, you know, it's not just buying some button mushrooms, right? Like there's more to it. There's more, um, it's a more meaningful process for them. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about, and, and we've talked before about this idea um, of if we, as a small grower, have any currency against a, a major farm, that, that it might be that personal relationship that we can have with people. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that your... I mean, because you clearly seem to enjoy that aspect of it. I mean, not only as a YouTube educator and someone who wrote a book about growing mushrooms to help other people be able to grow mushrooms, but it's pretty obvious that that, and you've mentioned that you like to chronicle and, and keep track of your, your process through the, the channel as well, but you clearly are generous and enjoy that relationship that you have with other growers and, and the buyers at your farmer's markets. You want to talk a little bit about what that means to you and, and how that's helped you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm super grateful for all of our customers. Um, I think that getting the direct feedback is the most important thing because, you know, you can send 500 pounds of mushrooms off to a grocery store and then, there's a disconnect between those people buying those mushrooms, having like an experience and then going back to that person and being like, this is what I enjoyed or this is what I didn't like. What, what kind were those? There's like an educational aspect and there's also this rewarding fuel that comes from seeing the same people week after week who really enjoy your mushrooms. And I recently calculated I'm getting up to 12,000 pounds of mushrooms that I've sold to the community here in Denver. And that's like mind blowing to me. Um, but I'm really appreciative and it makes everything worth it when I'm literally handing those people the mushrooms that I just picked that morning. And I know it's a good quality product because they're coming back week after week. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. I eat the mushrooms all the time and it's like this this physical connection that is non-existent in today's world. You know, we're very digital and even right now I'm having this conversation, but it's like, is it as good as talking to someone face to face at the farmer's market? Right. No, you know, no, but it's very close because, though, Gary, it's very close. I would say so too. And I get to sit in my little chair and, yeah. you know, just enjoy the, uh, the moment. So there's pros and cons. Like obviously it's yeah. a lot of work. Um, and some of the days like back in May, we had a snowstorm. <laughs> it was like 30 degrees and snowing and I still went out there and it was crazy because we probably sold about half of our mushrooms and there's people yeah. coming in like snow jackets and with their little bags and still wanted our mushrooms. And it was like, they're perfect for the soup today. And, that's like so rare in like in life. I don't know. It's very, yeah. it's almost addicting. Like it's addicting to be like present with, with the person who appreciates yeah. your work. Um, so I think that is probably one of the driving forces of my business. And even if I'm only doing one farmer's market, you know, a year, and then also distributing through other sources. We do a CSA program, which is a, a crop share. So 
Um, we do wholesale to this company called Grow Girl Organics in Arvada, which is up north, and they hand deliver these boxes. So there's still this connection, right. but she just picks up our mushrooms twice a week. Um, and that's a way to make my farm more efficient, but it does lose some of that connection because I'm relying on mm. her to educate them what type of mushroom this is, what are good recipes with this mushroom. And luckily there's some cross pollination between some of her customers and the people that come to the farmer's market and just all the small mushroom farms that are popping up. It's like when I first started, they'd be like, what is that? I've never seen that before. Now they're like, you guys have my Taki. Do you have oysters? I'm like, whoa, like as a, in the past four or five years, right. the knowledge from our consumers has gone up. Fantastic Fungi was one of the best movies that ever happened um, yeah, in recent for times sure. for the mushroom industry. Everyone's curious. Everyone's looking to be healthier, especially after the pandemic. Um, it's just such a rapidly evolving and growing industry that I think a lot of it contributes to having that one-on-one -on -one connection at the farmer's markets. And I definitely would not be as good of a grower if I wasn't doing that every week. And just, you know, I get to critique my own little boxes as I'm handing them off. Like people right. are like sifting through what are the best looking ones. So I get that kind of knowledge. Um, and yeah, I think that as time goes on, having a connection with your food is going to be even more important. And right. people, I, I try to get people to grow their own mushrooms because that's even more of a connection, but people don't have the skill or the time. So, you know, I'll, I'll grow mushrooms for them all day long, but um, the more people who grow their own, the more strains are going to come out the more hype is going to be generated and it's just a rising yep. tide. And that's what I, that's yeah. what I tell everybody. I say, so this mentality of, I figured something out, I have to hide it from everyone or, um, ah, I've heard things like, yeah, there doesn't need, everybody doesn't need to be breeding or, um, yeah, there's a, there's enough vendors now and, and all this kind of stuff. And I have seen in, I won't go into details, but if you're trying to build energy and momentum and participation in a growing field, it doesn't make sense to go get the fuck out of here or eh, I'm not going to talk to you about that. And uh, you should want engagement on every level. I, there's nobody I won't try to convince they should try to grow mushrooms cool. Nine out of 10 of them might stop after they, they try it once, but everybody should try, right? Everybody Absolutely. should. Why Absolutely. shouldn't you try? You might, you might it's love it. Fun. Yep. It's super fun. And, and yeah, it's like a, it's a microcosm of life in general. I think yep. you, you have to be organized. You have to be clean. You have to have a plan. It's not easy. So there's a lot of failure. So it creates like a, discipline and it creates you know you see yourself develop over the course of time which is why i love filming my youtube because i can look back two years ago and see the mushrooms i was growing and just see and where like, it comes oh God, that. God. yeah yeah i have these pictures <laughs> right. of my first grow which i probably should have uploaded those ah, it's it doesn't yeah. matter but next time. Um, yeah, you're one of the few people who who I've talked to who's mentioned that it's a way of cataloging and, and uh, storing that history. Mm -hmm. um, I remember getting a, this is a little side tangent, but I remember getting some little thing on Facebook one time where they're like, you should, uh, you should do, a, open a Gmail account for your child when they're first born. And you should send your child, your your imagined, you know, child as an adult, little emails all the time. Like, oh, well, today you, you know, you walked for the first time. Or you, you know what you did today? You uh, got in a fight with your brother. And, you know, just like telling these little stories, right? And I just, of course, I didn't do it because I'm a lazy piece of shit of American. But... <laughs> But I mean, I was so touched reading that and then just thinking about 
wow, I can't even imagine if someone did that for me. If on my 18th birthday, when I graduated high school, my parents said, oh, and by the way, you know, when you tried to open that Gmail account with your name and you got really pissed off because you couldn't, it was because I opened it and we've sent you, you know, a million emails in the last 18 years. That would be the coolest thing in the world, right? So you kind of have that. You have your whole journey. And not only as a content creator, but as a mushroom farmer. So on both levels, you're watching yourself grow. And, and as an educator as well, you know, I'm, I imagine that with everyone, every video you do, you get better at describing what you're doing and figuring out what I need to show and what I don't need to show to con convey my point and all that. So that's, I mean, I bring this up just because I think there's still a lot of knowledge out in the general myco community. And I always encourage people, give it a try. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a podcast that's coming out in December. And uh, some of the people involved were like, they were getting along and gelling so well. They're like, we need to do a radio show. And I was like, do it, man. Like, obviously, we all need more shit to watch when we're doing our transfer sessions, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, I I'm very, I'm very much on, on your side as far as get people more involved. If they want to learn, teach them. Um, it, it, it will never be the bad move to get more people in, involved in, in loving mushrooms. Absolutely. So as your t-shirt, um, yeah, as a love. visual, uh, someone had asked where that came from. I said, I thought it was from the Telluride festival, but I wasn't positive. Nope, this one's from Etsy. So, oh, okay. We we uh, had, I paid some guy on Fiverr or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's uh, it's on Etsy and it's super comfortable material. Oh wait, this is this is your shirt. Yeah, this is me. Oh cool. Okay, well we know yeah. how to find you then. Yeah, fresh fun guy on Etsy. Yeah. Nice. So i um, so I guess a big topic of debate in the realm in Denver is going to be this initiative. Oh yeah, let's talk One, about that. One twenty-two. So I don't know. I I've spoken my mind about the development of, you know, the the magic mushroom industry in Colorado for a couple of years, and my stance is that I think that from a consumer point of view, there should be some kind of a regulated, accessible industry. Now, yeah. building that around the freedom of you know people being able to cultivate their own and then also people being able to you know have a wide selection is going to be important um i know that a lot of people are campaigning vote no on this initiative and i don't know why i feel like that's kind of a selfish thing to do because we have an opportunity to, you know, move forward and right. then there will be adjustment periods. Um, but I don't know what your thoughts are, are on all that from an outside perspective. There's an argument to be made that there should be no corporations or no corporate involvement. But to me, that's just slows progress. Um, well, but it's I, also slightly naive, mm -hmm. like wake the fuck up. I mean, I don't know what America you live in, but Apple uh, makes my, every time I do a software update on my iPhone, my reception gets shittier and I can't do anything about it. I've watched a million YouTube videos on guys that are trying to, you know, the, like a right to repair. I don't know if you've heard about the whole right to repair yep, thing that's going on with Tesla and a bunch of other stuff. But these companies are going to make it so we can't even repair our own shit anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like we never even really own a Tesla because I can't, I can't change my own oil in it, right? Yeah. Get it? I can't change my own oil in it. Anyway, <laughs> bad bad yeah. joke there. Um, so I personally think, obviously, there is it is diluted to think that you are going to keep big business out of any growing emerging profitable market mm -hmm. how are you gonna do that it didn't happen for uh cannabis mm -hmm. i, I yeah. mean fr from what i've heard um i got a buddy who's a lawyer and he said uh pretty much on average if you want to start a grow uh you 
probably need pretty close to $5 million just to start to play ball. That's, that's like just to get going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have a lot of money. As far as the cannabis industry, it started off as a lottery for whoever could get the licenses. So they would have, I think it was once a day or once every other day, you would pay money to enter this lottery and then they would draw like two names out. And some people, you know, they got a license for a hundred bucks or other people, they would do it day after day until they, you know, were bled dry and they didn't even get a chance. So then they changed the initiative to, you know, a higher price point, but then people were scooping up those and holding right. on to them. Then they had to have it so one business entity can only own two licenses. So then they would sell all of them to themselves with other right. businesses. <laughs> it's just a game. Right. It's a game. Um, it's all every, It's all a big game. Everything's a game. Yeah. So, so my real thought is always – if you go in looking at the legislation saying, is it setting a precedent and is it setting the right precedent? Despite the fact that it's obviously almost in every circumstance going to pan out to ultimately benefit best the people with the most money and the most lawyers. I personally, I would like to challenge that though. I think that it will benefit the people that are seeking the, the outcome of the product the most because even if you have five corporations that own all of the whole industry they will compete against each other and the only the company that's benefiting the consumer is going to win so unless there's a monopoly which maybe there there would be a monopoly here in Colorado until it became federally legal but right i think that having money is just forcing innovation and it will increase the the quality of the product according to what the consumer wants like you can have all the money in the world but if you're making some product that no one wants it's not going to sell so that's kind of the 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 angle that i don't understand is like if there's a mom and pop guy that's you know growing mushrooms and they're selling them directly to the consumer and then they have such a bond that that person's not going to go buy some you know walmart brand mushrooms i don't know i feel like there's going to be that option too and it's just up to the consumer yeah so the my other thought is always this as far as the legislation goes so let's say somehow you got this dream you know the small fish legislation favors the the little guy and all that kind of stuff and they start making money and people start getting happy and you know grandma and grandpa are doing are going on uh psilocybin retreats and uh culturally the perception actually starts changing pretty significantly you think that that's going to be the end of the legislation you don't think that at that point then all the lobby from these big corporations aren't going to come in and go well we got some new legislation now we need to make some changes so to me i don't know i feel like it's always it will always ultimately end up being a small number of powerful wealthy people getting what they want anyway i i'm a bit of a pessimist as far as this goes Mm -hmm. so for me i focus on is the legislation going to do anything for me and give me the power to make a difference in people's lives and as long as i can do that i'm I'm pretty happy now i do want to pull this up i don't know if you have a thought on this you're definitely more well versed in this than i am but uh mike uh says the Colorado initiative is a corporate takeover paid for by new approach pack, same pack that funded the initiative in Oregon, uh, $2,000 a session is a slap in the face. And I've heard about this where they're going to have the right to charge. I, th- I thought it was even closer to three or $4,000 a session. And, mm-hmm. and, and the fear that comes from, you know, the big money that's going to be able to set these kind of things up. Um, have you heard anything about the therapeutic side or the the trip sitting businesses and all that. so yeah so at the telluride mushroom festival um there is you know a bunch of seminars on this and right now there are places that are operating in mexico 
Jamaica, South America, and they're already charging $2,000 to go down there. But it seemed awesome. So one mm-hmm. of them is called the Blue Portal, and it's by Trad Cotter. And they played this video where, you know, you go down there and it's a week long and it's intimate. So you're getting the, the value because you're having these one-on-one, you know, consultations with a therapist and there's a screening process. And then they give you a journal and, you know, you get to sit on this beautiful beach in Jamaica and think about things. And then they guide you through the trip too. So for someone who's doing it for the first time, You know, why wouldn't you want to be in the best possible scenario? And then afterwards, there's integration. So they're watching you. They're they're doing like art and therapy. And it's more than just you just show up and eat a bunch of mushrooms. It's like an experience. And there's, you know, honeymoon packages for $5,000. But then you can just go to a public beach too. Like it's life. So I feel like there should be this value, like that's capitalism. So there's this, as long as there's also like you can go to a dispensary and buy some mushrooms and do it yourself. Or as long as there's also protection for the person who wants to grow their own or, you know, have like a few selected people that they cultivate for and they're trusted and they're doing it at a super small economical scale like there shouldn't be restrictions um but there should also be options like it doesn't make sense to to hate someone for providing the best possible experience in the world like i feel like that's selfish to limit someone just as much as it's selfish to make it illegal like it shouldn't be illegal but it should also be you know available to anyone for the full experience or for you know you should be able to do it yourself which right in denver it's decriminalized so technically it's the least you know pursued problem with law enforcement right yeah i know so i did spread the spores uh, in Detroit and talked to some people there and I was pretty impressed slash, uh, shocked at how flagrant the, 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 the fruit was a flowing. And I got to talking to some people and they were like, yeah, you know, um, one guy was like, I I've talked to police officers and they pretty much say the minute it's decriminalized, we don't give a fuck. Yeah. And just it comes off the plate. Just not, it's just not a concern anymore. Now, I don't think necessarily, I don't know if that is uh, unilaterally true for all police officers. I don't know if there isn't one random police chief that, you know, could say decriminalize doesn't mean we can't ever prosecute. But um, it, it's definitely, for me, a step in the right direction because it changes the attitude. It was really powerful for me to hear that somebody heard a cop say to them, well, it's not a crime now. So I I don't like, it's been taken off my priority list Mm -hmm. and, and that that police officer didn't care anymore. They're sort of robotically like it's not on my list. So it's probably not that big of a deal. Not to mention uh, the fact that now, unlike the 70s, when it was there was no social media and there were no expose YouTube content vloggers, um, that it was so easy to control the narrative back then about psychedelics, whereas now the narrative is being driven by the st- millions of stories that you and I and everybody else are hearing every day, which is this stuff is doing some really great things for people and it should probably not only be decriminalized, but be legalized uh, at least at a minimum on a therapeutic level uh, as soon as possible. Now, um, I do see the the counterpoint to, so setting these therapeutic centers up or these retreats up obviously is going to take money and bringing in doctors and, you know, hopefully that's all regulated so that that's set up the right way. But I still personally believe that 
like you said, if I, even if I'm just getting a small fraction of the population having a positive experience in this realm that they would not have normally had, that is steps in the right direction. And, and you're, you're just, I don't care what the legislation looks like. It, it's eventually always going to be written to favor um, the, those wealthier people. It seems to be a little ideological uh, rhetoric to think that you could write a piece of legislation that's going to pass that favors the guy that has no lobby in, in Colorado. You know, mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem likely. Um, anyway, but without getting too political about all that kind of stuff, the the great news is you live in the coolest state as far as uh, psychedelics go, um, ethnogenic uh, plant medicine and, and whatnot. So that's very cool. Um, if it was ever uh, legalized, would you be interested in growing more than gourmets? So probably not. Um, I mean, my passion is just growing food. Okay. Um, You're a I farmer. Mean, I get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not against it. Um, mm -hmm. I just think that that would be a whole nother world. And I mean, I, I would be open to adding like an element of that to my mushroom Mecca like vision. But personally, I think that it comes with a lot of responsibility and, Yes. It's like a whole new level of mushroom cultivation that I don't think I would be interested in. Um, sure. But I mean, I think that the more opportunities there are for everyone, the better. Um, and then competition is just going to right. increase the quality. It's going to increase the efficiency of the process. It's going to increase the standards. Like there's, you know, a very realistic chance that someone could get poisoned or, you know, very sick from E. coli or salmonella or right. some of these pathogens that are not being tested for, even different right. mycotoxins from penicillium and aspergillus and just common molds that are occurring in cultivation. Like that should be screened for and that will make it a safer product. Um, there should be a potency test attached to every, you know, pr product that's released. And the more and more knowledge that the, that the consumer has, right. the ultimate, the future of the industry would benefit. The future of humanity would benefit, you know, they're, Psychedelic I, I, I can see that happening. Yeah. I mean, the HPLC labs are already popping up. Um, you know, Flourish is run by a guy with a PhD uh, in biochemistry. The guy's a beast. Mm -hmm. He really knows his shit. And um, he he and I have talked a bit, and he also sees the, the testing in this sphere to only get more prominent. And he thinks that the future, like you think, includes shelf life, includes um, harvest dates, a lot of transparency about the grow and, mm -hmm. and what's in it. And uh, the one thing that we haven't talked about that you bring up is uh, the randomized testing for various pathogens and mm -hmm. toxicity that could or, you know, you know, some of these guys, they amend their soils with <laughs> all sorts of stuff. And, you know, we assume that it seems like it's okay, but who knows? We, we don't really know what's going on. So, yeah. So I think it's going to just be helpful for everyone. And so what, if it's a little bit of a barrier to entry, then uh, just save up your money. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Right. Like, but the, and there will always be the other layer. There'll always be multiple layers to this. I mean, like the, the, for example, with cannabis legal medicinally in so many states, it doesn't mean there's not a single guy on the corner selling weed. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, I there, mean, there I are grow, still all the layers. I grow my own, and there's a dispensary less than a mile away from me. Right. So that that's a a mute point to me. Right. Because I have the freedom to grow my own. So what? Where's the problem? Um, that's all I have to say is, yeah, you know, but you're right about the pathogens because 
Now, I am definitely not an expert on the cannabis industry, but I remember reading not too long ago, I think it was in Michigan, some a major crop had to be recalled because of some some contamination. I'm not sure what it was. And, and then it sort of uncovered the fact that, wow, a lot of this stuff is not tested like it was supposed to be tested. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that. Yeah. And cannabis, and cannabis, one of the big problems is that there's these huge outdoor farms and there's a very short window of time where they harvest and process all that product. Right. So sometimes it can get into late October and then, you know, your product starts to get moldy and right. there can be different molds that accumulate mycotoxins and they won't push that product as a flower, but they'll try to wholesale that to concentrate companies. Oh. And some of these mycotoxins, right. they aren't destroyed by heat or, you know, pressure. So all the processing is doing is concentrating those toxins and luckily there's legislation in place that's catching these mycotoxins before they hit the shelf and you know thankfully it's right. a pretty safe product and from what i've read you know they get recalled before they hit the shelf and it saves you know public health and safety correct so that level of um scrutiny that should exist because ultimately it's just going to create a better product. And I and, think that and it's, it's better yeah. PR for, for exactly. that industry. You, yep. I mean, what you don't want to do is go leave us alone. Don't regulate me, leave me be, just make it legal and let me do whatever I want. And then as you have these little things pop up, you know, all you got to do is have somebody's senator's daughter uh, has a neurogenic disorder now because she's decided to prove that it came from some mushrooms she used to do when she microdosed for three years or, you know, some crazy shit like that. And now the, the bad press comes out. 100% we should always want the good press. We should and, and we should want the good press because what we're doing is good. Exactly. And we are we've learned from all the mistakes of cannabis and we've learned from the mistakes of big pharma. And we know that the FDA isn't, you know, doing everything perfectly all the time. They're they're obliged to political influence as well. And um, man, I don't know if you've seen uh, there's a documentary on Netflix called The Bleeding Edge, and it's about how the medical equipment or medical device wing of the FDA is like radically underfunded and they grandfather a lot of technology. And so while the first initial technology has to be verified and proven, then they just grandfather and everything after that. And a lot of times they make significant technological changes to that and it is not investigated. And you got people who are having major horrible, uh, surgical complications as a result of that. Um, a lot of wire mesh, uh, mesh surgeries have had this problem. And so you, you do ultimately, even though you want the regulation and with that comes beer bureaucracy that on a lot of levels sucks at the end of the day, you do want an industry that protects people's health at a bare minimum and hopefully provides therapeutic healing medicine that ch literally changes people's lives without mm -hmm. bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that as long as the end goal where people are being healed or people are being able to do what they want with their own body, that is the end goal. But, you know, to get there the best way possible, I think we work as a community. Like everyone should be a community. That's what I think of myself. I am a human on earth and contributing to this great civilization. So, yeah. you know, pr putting my part and saying, you know, I, I just think the standards should be raised and there should be an opportunity, but there should also not be uh, this overarching pressure right. against someone to do what they are capable of doing. So, how do you find that balance? I think that you move forward and then you adjust. You move forward and then you adjust. Otherwise, there will never be progress. So I know that there's this huge debate in Denver right now um, 
we'll see what happens in November. Um, I think it's pretty progressive city all around. And I hope that there isn't like this maleficence or this underlying evil, you know, agenda. I just don't see it though. I see it as people that are trying to do the right thing. A lot of money is behind it, but I mean, money is just a tool. It's a tool and it's a, it's a efficient mechanism of value that's been produced, shifting it towards, you know, something innovative or at least cutting edge. There's no other country or I guess there's regions within our country that are starting to see this, you know, this process through and it's slowly changing, but I feel like, you know, the driving forces are just working against the psychedelic movement. So any step forward to me is a win, but I can, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to want, yeah. want to continue momentum where momentum exists, even if it's not perfect. And I mean, look, mm -hmm. this wouldn't be the first piece of legislation to get shot down because it's not perfect from either side. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, and, and who knows, you and I could be totally wrong and it could happen and uh, the world could come to an end because we passed this legislation. <laughs> I'm thinking probably not. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking the worst case that happens is what already exists everywhere, which is all the major companies who are still mostly held to some level of standards. Uh, maybe not always perfectly, but the, that's that's the goal and the legislation's at least there to do that. That's my hope. Is yeah, that my hope is just to have everyone just keep talking about it. And eventually all of our thoughts and words will lead to this place in the middle somewhere. And, you know, we'll just all move right. forward and have perspective. And as long as we can just all join together and, you know, just be a healthy community. Like that's the main objective for me as a citizen. And I'm thankful to live in Denver. I'm thankful to live in America. And I'm just thankful to live at this period in time where I can have this conversation with you and just yeah. share my thoughts freely. And hopefully, you know, I'm right, but I don't know, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm open to debate. And uh, I just appreciate having this time to think these thoughts through and you know, be able to share my story. I hope that I inspire people to, you know, grow mushrooms and to do what they want to do. And it's uh, super rare that we we live in a society where at any point you can just change your mind and, you know, right. I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to do this. And I've experienced that firsthand over and over again. And, you know, I love growing mushrooms though. So I feel like I've at least got, 30 or 60 or 90 more years than me, whatever, until I can, uh, can't take it anymore. The, then, then you can have the, the kids growing them for you. You can just sit back and <laughs> you can just sit back and gatekeep information from them. <laughs> you figure it out. God damn it. I had to figure it out. Yeah. That'll be a whole new experience to, <laughs> to have fresh eyes and fresh, yeah. fresh thoughts. Like, I don't even think I'm doing it that good, but I'm doing it better than yesterday. So right. that's uh that's the only thing that matters. And if you have a girl, are you thinking uh my Taki? <laughs> I think that's a cool girl name. I don't know what it would be for a boy name though. My uh, names. One of my friends firstborn son is Bo and it's uh short for Bolitas. Oh, okay. But yeah, we've got her name picked out and it's gonna be a boy. Oh, you know. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. I, we're, we're planners and we're very organized and, uh, you know, it's been a long time coming, so I'm thankful and I'm mm -hmm. excited, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep everyone in the loop and I'll probably just dip out for a couple months actually and just focus in on the new baby and the new building and it's going to be a new chapter. I'm working on a book too. Um, it's just mostly some of the stuff that I cut out of my ebook. So okay. anyone who's interested, and if you're still paying attention, I did write a book called 
Growing Gourmet Mushrooms for Market. It's a complete guide for growing gourmet mushrooms at home and making a living. It's on our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, and it's an ebook and it has integrated links to my videos and different products. And I'm, I'm going to build off of that book to have a more, I would say, advanced mycology techniques and different breeding processes and how to scale production. And it's going to be a second half to this like beginner's guide. And I've worked on that for a little bit, but I like sitting down in the winter and cranking out YouTube videos and kind of gathering my thoughts for the next season. And whenever this book comes out, it might be next year, it might not be for a decade, but my hopes is to get that one onto a hard copy and um, just have more pictures. I think, you know, the feedback I've gotten was not enough pictures and just, I really like the integration of an ebook though. So right. linking that to the videos and just creating like this system of teaching people very efficiently is going to ultimately lead to better and better mushroom strains. And maybe one day I won't have to breed anymore, but um, until that day, I'm just going to be doing breeding my worst mushrooms until all of them are efficient and, you know, I can uh, have a lot less time in production and more time having conversations like this. Yeah. I, so uh, I today uh, perused your, your Etsy again. I had not looked at it for, for a hot second and uh, was impressed with the, as someone who basically sells one thing in some merch, um, I really appreciated how diversified uh, your product offering is. Um, I'm probably going to have to get some of those lion main, uh, lion's main capsules uh, yep. myself because um, I just already know the quality is going to be exceptional. It's not going to be fluff like half of these other companies are. Um, oh, yeah. But you're you're killing it, man. You're, uh, you want to talk just a little bit about Etsy? Because I've sort of chosen Etsy, <laughs> and I'm happy with it uh, overall. Yep. Um, I don't yep. like how much they take out of my, uh, my paycheck, but um, – I think it offers people uh, buyers protection and it's a legitimate platform and I have absolutely no say in the reviews. Um, so on a lot of levels, it seems to be a very ethical, transparent uh, platform, but you are surely utilizing it better than me. So I thought maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So it took a while, like it takes a long time to grow your Etsy, at least in my perspective. But for me, all right, so starting off, I liked Etsy because it had like a shipping deal where I couldn't find it. Like I, I sometimes I'll use Shippo if I'm sending it to yeah. a country that isn't offered by Etsy, but the pricing on the shipping was awesome. So over the course of time, that's helped out my business tremendously. And I could, you know, come down on my prices where as when I first joined Etsy, I was in the top 10% in pricing i haven't raised my prices since then hmm. and now i'm in the bottom 40 percent. so it's cool because nice. you can compare yourself against the market um it, you get really good feedback um the, i like the messaging feature i will eventually move into my own website as well but i wanted to learn on a platform and all of these fees that you pay get reinvested back into the platform. So right. when I first started, there wasn't advertising. There wasn't like off-site ads. And even the Super Bowl had a commercial for Etsy. So some of my value that I'm paying is going to obviously, right. you know, the CEO or whatever. But then some of it is also driving the advancement of this platform. Right. And I like what they stand for. You know, it's all people that just are hobbyists or creating their crafts like in-house um one of my my friend's dad he makes these like uh like brass sculptures and sells them on etsy and it's like cool that i can relate to him too as a vendor right and then we can cross you know market each other um i think that it offers a great platform to start but long term 
I'll probably have my Etsy always and then also have direct sales because I want to sell tinctures and I want to be able to ship my fresh mushrooms, which I can't do on Etsy. Right. So there's some limitations, but for right now, I love it. Um, you know, if, if someone's trying to sell my cultures, not on Etsy, just know that it's not me. Don't buy capsules from someone on TikTok. Um, just do, don't do it. Um, but it, it like legitimizes the stream right. of, you know, flow from customers to, um, to producer. So, you know, they're legitimized middleman, I, I would say. <laughs> Basically, that's what it is. And um, yeah, some pe- sometimes people will get cultures lost, lost in the mail and it's my last culture, but then Etsy will step in and, you know, they'll make things right. So there's been a couple instances where they helped out both parties and, you know, I've had repeated customers after that where maybe if I just had, you know, my WordPress website and there wasn't a proper, like, right. you know, middleman, then I would have lost that customer. Um, so I think that it's paid off and I, you know, there's affiliate marketing too. So right when, uh, when I did that video on the induction sterilizer, which I still use that all the time, um, right. I, I made a couple bucks off of that because of the affiliate program. Um, but then I suggested the pedals and ever since then it just tanked cause I, I don't have affiliate for the pedal one, but it's okay. Oh, oh, we'll work on that. Yeah. We'll on <laughs> yeah. That. But yeah. Um, well, no, I have a, well, a mostly love, but prior to that video, I had taken a stance. I did not prefer the pedal. I didn't think it was necessary. Uh, I had made one with a pedal and I just kept tripping over it. So I was like, I don't need this. This, you know, I, I, I personally thought the reason people wanted the pedal was they thought, oh, it'll surely be a vector for contamination if you have to touch the button. I and like I never, it because you can hold your plate and then do that. Yes, it, it does free things up for that. But yeah. anyway, so as soon as you said that, I was so bombarded by people going when are you gonna make a pedal gary said you should make a pedal i'm like god damn it gary why did i have to fucking say that but anyway i will say this i finally caved and started making the pedal and now i would say it's nine ninety percent nine out of ten are 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 the foot pedal so clearly i didn't know what the fuck i was talking about and i listened to you uh and your very uh adamant uh fan base who said gary said you need to start making a pedal model so i did yeah, so anyway. the market decides you do the market decides i mean <laughs> why would you want to make something for your own selfish reason like if you started making some weird cordyceps mushroom strain that was green or some shit and and you thought oh this is the coolest one in the world but no one was buying it like you know four months later you'd just be like Okay, I tried that, and no, I was wrong. No one wants that. Move on. So yeah, yeah I was wrong. I was totally wrong about that. But <laughs> live and learn. It's okay. Cool. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the sterilizer, and yeah, I feel like. Well, so you were so great. I didn't even expect. I mean, of course, I was hoping you would do a video, but I didn't. I definitely did not anticipate you were going to absolutely do the perfect demo of how it integrates into your workflow. Uh, you basically summed up all anybody that doesn't understand who I can tell, like they don't, they're not quite sure if they need it or not. I just send them to that link and just say, watch this. When you get done watching it, you'll know whether you want to buy one or not. Yeah. Well, so, I've been waiting for that product for years because, you know, I, I have this list on my dry board or dry erase board of like, priority items and back back to Cinerator is always like number four number yeah. five but i didn't want to drop that money on there and then i saw yeah. that one i'm like holy crap this is like the best it's like the same product but way less and yeah i mean yeah I'm not and you don't float, but it's pretty obvious that's awesome <laughs> I was going to buy one and, and my whole issue, I, cause I used them in microbio classes and, uh, and then I read 
uh, one of the manuals, and it said um, putting a scalpel in this thing voids the warranty. I was like, oh, it's not even designed for the, I mean, obviously lots of people do it. Like I'm not saying nobody in the world does this. Everybody does it. But I was like, if I'm going to drop 500 bucks on this thing, I don't want to fuck up the warranty. Yeah. So then I just kept looking and, and of course you go on Reddit and somebody's making it already. You know, these guys for their Dynavapes, they'd been making them for three years before I even considered doing it. So anyway, yeah, the internet's great. It solves a lot of problems for people, and uh, as long as you stay off Facebook, it, it uh, is pretty low drama most of the time. So, absolutely, yeah, you got to procure your own environment. Yes. Um, well, so I am super. I I, I think we've kind of uh, concluded our little conversation, but I thought we could open up if you got time for a few questions. Are you up for that? Yeah, I'm just going to refill my beverage and then I'll sure. be right back in like two seconds. All right, great. Okay, so guys, uh, I'm going to scroll back here. I know I had quite a few questions. I tried to tag some of them. Um, but if you have questions for Gary, post them and we will ask them. guys getting that sweet Gary ASMR right now what do you guys think he's doing sounds it's very noisy all right I got this question oh that was actually answered so I won't do that question all right give me like 30 seconds you're good Here we go. I got this question. Anyway, again, while while we uh, have a moment, let me just plug my buddy. He sent me this. This is a really high quality shirt. The Magic Mushroom Speaks. Uh, It is a pretty hype discord. Um, I'll I'll put the link in in the description of the YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, But the guy is constantly doing giveaways. Um, skews a little bit like young and high energy. So, you know, my 45 year old butt doesn't, I don't spend a lot of time in there, but every time I go in there, it's super fun and uh, a lot of enthusiastic uh, Michael Files in there for sure. Gary, your ASMR right now is, is primo. <laughs> cool. It's primo. Cool. All right, so I got some questions. All right, first one, Dark Matter. Maiko, uh, is the agar recipe for gourmets the same for cubes? If not, what ingredients work best uh, for gourmet mycelium? All right, so that's kind of a loaded question, I guess. I don't know. Um, I haven't tested every single agar recipe for every single strain, Mm -hmm. but I do know that Potato dextrose agar is pretty standard across the board. Malt extract agar, pretty standard across the board. Um, Black charcoal yeast agar, pretty standard. And I do have a video out there. It's called The Colors of Mycology. And it describes a few different selective and differential medias that I like to use in quality control. Um, Gourmet mushrooms can... I feel like they can have more rigor, especially like a, like a oyster mushroom. Um, you can grow it on, you know, cardboard ground up and put on agar. Uh, so I feel like there's more, uh, acceptable media types, but as far as like that specific procurement, watch that video. Um, I like to do a a V nine agar, which is like V eight vegetable juice and potato flakes and that has like a really nice embodiment of nutrients. Get creative. Um, if you haven't read uh, um, Peter McCoy's book, right. it, Radical Mycology, there's like three pages of all different types of agar recipes. And I assume that those work for active mushrooms and gourmet mushrooms. Um just give it a try. I don't know. I think that variation 
strengthens the mushroom over time because it has to develop new enzymes that are specific towards that media. So switching it up is something that I do all the time. If I'm storing a mushroom on potato dextrose for a while, maybe I'll do my next transfer on some malt extract right. just to revigorate it, or if that's a word, I don't know, to bring it back a little bit stronger. That's just my opinion. I don't know if there's a paper on that, but I've also seen tip, tip of the cap mushrooms. He has like some kind of a compost auger, which is really cool. Um, so adapting. He's like, got every kind of auger. Yeah. What am I he's saying? He's got a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I saw uh, recently one of my buddies, um, he had a, a post on Facebook and it was, um, he boils spaghetti and then just takes the spaghetti water for his agar. Do it. I was, I was like, nice. And of course he leaves a little pieces of spaghetti in there just for effect. Yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of looked like worms. Fun. It was a little gross, but, but, but he swears by it. Um, I have also never done the making, uh, boil potatoes the old fashioned way and use the, I've never done that. I haven't done a lot of that stuff. Um, though I did buy for a while, uh, a basic PDA dry mix from, from Tim at tip of the cap. And, uh, Mike definitely liked it. I mean, when you read the white papers, it's either MEA or PDA for, for the most part. So you, I think you can't go wrong. And I've caught caught. I didn't, they weren't, they weren't running away from me. I, I harvested some, uh, wild mushrooms in my yard a few times and uh, they're obviously wood lovers, but they don't care. You put the mic on the, the plates and they seem to grow just fine. Yep. Um, okay, I got some more here. Oh, uh, Wumbo Maiko said when we were, you were talking about the um, uh, tween 20, he just uh, mentioned that you do not need a lot. Uh, one single small drop per gallon is, is more than enough. Yes. So don't, it's not like washing your dishes where more is better. Yeah. Uh, you do not need a lot It more. can get bubbly really easily. Yeah. Um, all right. My one buddy brought up some stuff, but we're going to talk about that on another podcast. So I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, uh, quick little plug. Help Grow Food just says I'm rocking Gary's Lion's Mane. Just harvested uh one pound, 12 ounces off a five pound block last night. Good job. Yeah. Bravo. Um, That's I have more grown than lines like my average. Yeah. Once and I, I did not get that much. I can tell you that. It, but it was maybe because I didn't get Gary's. Yep. I got that from um, Niagara Falls, New York. Uh -huh. so the guy who taught me how to grow mushrooms, he had been growing that for about a decade maybe. Oh, so wow. I cloned some of his fruits and that's what I've been growing for five years now. Nice. I am waiting to carve out enough space in my basement to get a nice little Martha tent going. And, and then I'm going full speed ahead. But yeah. for the time being, I, I need the stuff that do, don't need humidified tents. Um, okay. Hold on. I'm scrolling through here. I need to get better at um oh um i'm just gonna put this up here you you've set a couple gems tonight you might not realize it um edward uh who who is uh, an absolute stellar mycologist in his own right and we will probably have on the podcast here shortly um he said procure your own environment gary is a prophet well thank you um i don't know about right. that i just talk a lot of words and some of them work out <laughs> okay that is not going on the list of great things you said tonight i talk a lot of words <laughs> okay uh here we go uh cape collected wants to know do you plan on working with uh p microspora plastic eating fungi i know you if i'm not mistaken you had a little quick blitz of uh solana on your etsy right yeah so i have it in liquid culture i've attempted a few trials and I'm working out a full video so I can just kind of say some of the main issues that I've come across. Um, I've 
so my plan is to somehow make this like bioreactor like tabletop thing that you can just feed plastic into and just kind of keep this mushroom growing that would um, be cool but there are some issues with the the hydrophobic nature of plastic so i'm trying to create like a a very sparse media that would bind the plastic figure out what's the best way to you know prepare this plastic can you just throw chunks in there or does it have to be ground up for more service gonna area? Say to shred the crap out of it right yeah and, so i've yeah. done that before but there's some limitations to the water c- capacity yeah. um so i think that there, it's going to be a little more complicated than i first thought um, i also want to bring it to fruiting which i haven't been able to do but the idea behind that is that I could have spores and I work out from spores to develop other strains that are geared towards specific different types of plastic. So I, you know, I was very ambitious at first and just tried to do some trials. And um, I feel like getting to the next step of figuring out a good media blend with the plastic and some kind of like momentum other than what everyone thinks is that i'm just gonna grind up plastic and squirt on a liquid culture um but i'm working on it it's uh probably number three or four on my list of videos i'm trying to step up my video game honestly like my editing um, i really enjoy creating content so i'm trying to dial back the quantity and go for quality and then um, maybe I'll change my mind when I start getting bored in the winter, but, um, that's kind of my philosophy right now. So it, I'm working on a video with, uh, the plastic eating fungi, but it's had a lot of hurdles that I didn't expect. And my next priority is going to be this, uh, liquid culture, like scaling, um, my liquid culture challenge, I'm going to call it is how do you produce the most liquid culture in the shortest period of time. And then I'm going to try to inoculate it onto that hillside. And, um, dude, you need to get Mr. Yeah. Beast involved on this one. I feel like oh, that'd you, be just, cool. you started using words that made me think like, let's get Mr. Beast involved. He's got money. He can make this happen for us. That would be awesome. If inoculate the that, world, Mr. Beast style. Yeah. If yes. Mr. Beast ever listens to this, um, I would just need a, a a sprayer truck and um, easy he can a, do that in a sleep man a giant aerator for the inside of that truck and then uh yeah just a lot of uh dense fertile land <laughs> to spray <laughs> he can buy it all man he's giving away houses as we speak to perfect awesome. strangers yes all right um this is a little off topic but uh i like these questions uh, just because I, I think it helps uh, complexify and people see you as a person and not just a maniacal mushroom growing machine. What do you games? Ga- do you game? Not in a long time. So I used to play Call of Duty like uh-huh, 10 okay. years ago. But when we moved out here, I sold all my consoles and I used to even have like a Game Boy. I sold that. I just sold everything. And then I got really into, uh, like I said, like uh, flipping houses for a while. So that's kind of like my game. I don't know. I like to uh, to figure out my next project. And uh, I do play like Magic the Gathering. <laughs> that's like a... Cool. That it's is like my, fancy Pokemon. Yeah, that's my mm-hmm. voice. Every birthday... I'll go out and do a draft event. Um, so if you're lucky enough to be in that. How much did your deck cost, dude? Uh, I don't even want to know. I know those <laughs> decks are not cheap. That's yeah. all. I, I got a friend who does it, and he used to, I guess he used to be real good. And I think he said his deck was like, his competition deck was $900 or something. Yeah. Mine like, just, wow. Some of mine I just, you know, collect over time. There's a website called Puka Trader mm-hmm. where you can trade magic the gathering cards and you earn these points so like it's like a middleman nice um so i've done that a lot to procure my decks um but yeah when i have the time that's 
that's my game is uh magic the gathering there's a lot of like art there's a lot of uh you know face-to-face play so i prefer to you know have a group of people and we're all having a good time and right. you know semi-competitive for a hot second uh my kid was into pokemon and i'm i might have to confess that i got fairly enthusiastic about it for a while and and it's fun. I mean, it's, I love playing poker and stuff like that, but for the most part, I'm also not a gamer. So I like the complexity of it. I like how you have to adapt to everybody's decks and stuff like that. It's, it's fun. It gets you thinking. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. New question. Uh, this is my buddy, Hank Sinatra. Huh. Not to be confused. No, I'm kidding. Uh, for a home gamer doing cereal dilutions, how much sterile water and soap would you put in each jar and ho- how much are you transferring over each into your pipe? I think he's looking for like the basics of cereal dilution. Yeah. So. And you might have a video on this. If yeah. I, if, if I vaguely recall. Yep. Um, you can check out my playlist on breeding mushrooms. Uh that I did a cereal dilution with some oyster mushrooms, um, I believe with some chestnut mushrooms. I don't know. I did a bunch of mm-hmm. different experiments that I don't even remember what I filmed. But um, I would start with a spore print. And depending on how concentrated those spores are, maybe do 20 mils, like a, a 20 mil conical tube with a good amount of spores, like maybe like a quarter of a spore print. If it's like, you know, the size of a half dollar or something, then I would add a tiny amount of surfactant. And if you don't even add any, that's okay. It's not going to really make a huge difference. So don't go crazy with the soap unless you're doing really precise dilutions. Then I would do one mil from that main stock into nine mils and then that's a one to 10 dilution and you continue that probably four or five, the tube number four or five. So one or a 10,000 to a hundred thousand dilution will give you about one to 10 spores. That's an estimate. It might be a whole nother 10 factor, but um, that's what I would do. Cause usually a test tube rack comes with what six, six tubes so you do five dilutions in the stock tube um i hope that makes sense yeah so i mean and i have actually seen i I just watched uh my buddy ed do a video where he um took a spore print he aliquoted out just a drop of water on the print swirled it around a little bit sucked it back up spit it back out sucked it back up just to try to grab some spores, squirted that into a, a, a decent sized jar. It was probably 100 mLs, maybe 200 mLs. He just shook it up. I mean, and this is nothing fancy and, and, and diluted from there. So he sort of was like cheating the dilution process because at the end of the day, unless you're publishing a, a paper or you're looking for really repeatable where you're using like a hemocytometer to measure out your actual spore counts and all that, at the end of the day, your goal is just somehow dilute it down so that you have these individual spores that can can grow monocultures. Um, so, and I've been talking to him about this as well. You can either be real, real sp- specific and precise, where you're always, you know, whatever your given amount is, you're taking a tenth of that so that the next volume is is the same volume and and so on, mm-hmm. like you just described, or you can spitball it and maybe do a couple dilutions. Um, I know I talked to Yoshi and um, I think he was saying that typically the way he tends to do it, he's hitting uh, the right dilution at like three or four, the third or fourth um, dilution tube. So the trick is right. I'm tell me if I'm wrong, whatever you do, just do it a certain way so that you can do it again assuming that it works and you're not just you're not just rolling the dice every time hoping this time it works out that that really is the benefit of the serial dilution is Mm -hmm. is getting that down yeah that just made me think i'm gonna do another video on just to isolate a single spore in solution and you can use a pipette so 
you know, it's like in vitro fertilization. As long as you have a stereoscope, I feel like it's pretty easy, but I might do a video on that. So wait, so you're just trying to get one spore in a solution. In a pipette tip, yep. In the pipette tip, and then what are you doing with it? Shooting it onto agar. Oh, okay, okay. And then hopefully it germinates. If only we could develop the glow-in-the-dark spore gene. And then we just work in the dark. We'd see them all. You could just grab one. So with that's getting of... into a fish, which is fluorescent in situ hybridization. And you can get a tag, a fluorescent tag that would attach to just a random gene in a spore. So you add this uh, dye to a solution, shake okay. it up, put it in a UV, and you'd be able to do that. So they do that for cancer detection so th they'll use like a specific uh dye right. that's attached to a gene put it in cells sh you know you put it in your specimen that you receive in the lab and then you can look at those genes that are spread throughout the slide and if that's already happening i feel like you would just have to know the genome of the spore or like the species of the spore create a tag and then You'd have to pay a company that would produce the specific gene that would be attached to that fluorescent, and that that could be done pretty simple. All right, we're gonna work on it next yeah. year, guys. Let's do it. I got Alan coming in here shortly. We're gonna talk yeah. to him about it, and I got you know I got I got a few other dudes that can probably give some 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 clarifying uh, content for that. So. I can tell you right now, I saw how popular uh, unicorn bags, um, th them selling the um, plastic eating mycelium. I can only imagine what a glow in the dark spore dropping uh, mushroom w would do. So that sounds super fun. I was joking. I didn't realize that it might be in the realm of possibility. Uh, that is cool. All right. Next question from Brett. Uh, what attributes do you look for in different species to know when to harvest? Like, so basically, are there morphological clues that tell you when the, the right time to harvest is? So I always harvest before the spores drop. That could be different for like lots of different species. Um, but that is kind of the art of the cultivator is like, mm -hmm. when do you harvest your mushrooms? So some people like them really early before the spores drop before the veil even shows itself or for before you know it has a chance to uh get certain characteristics like on shiitake you know maybe you want to do it right before that fur starts to pop because then you get longer shelf life so there's trade-offs to when to harvest that's kind of an art form i would say just uh Pick them at different times. Let one block go long and see how you like it, and then pick another one early. And you'll you'll figure out what you prefer. Oh, yeah. addendum. Sorry, I flavor. meant for best flavor. So is, there, is there a trick yeah. about that? So it's the same. Um, I prefer to pick mine early. I think that there's the most flavor, but it's a preference. If you're going for yields. Or if you're growing so many mushrooms that you don't have time to schedule when you're going to pick them, there's like a sweet spot for every operation. Yeah, you just, at the end of the day, you got to, oh, I tell everybody because I get these people who ask me a bunch of questions about growing and then a, the day comes where I go, you need to start growing them now. Stop asking me <laughs> questions and just grow them. So yeah. yeah, I think some of these things are, um, I can't explain, right, uh, what the experience of uh, spore drop on Reishi. <laughs> I can yeah. tell you it's a lot, but <laughs> the first time you get it and you're like, he tried to warn me, I didn't listen to him, uh, I almost died. <laughs> I don't know where they all come from, to be quite honest. I feel like they drop uh, more than their actual weight in spores. It's <laughs> shocking. Yeah, and some people collect those spores, and they like will use that as a specific medicine. Mm -hmm. Like reishi cracked spores is a thing, but I don't know. I don't know enough about the science 
between that. Like that would be cool to test the spore organodermic acid content versus right. the fruiting body. Right there, there's a video. <laughs> yeah, man. If I had a HPLC machine sitting around and like fourteen thousand dollars worth of standards and I actually knew what I was doing, I pretty much never run out of tests to run on that thing, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so one thing we talk about in the Discord a lot is how we can work together and crowdfund um, projects uh, for potency or a lot of the questions. So, you know, everybody who does HPLC testing is mostly just trying to figure out potency um, as it pertains to a particular strain. Um, but I think there's a lot of fascinating continued work that could be done looking into cultivation practices and the influence they have on all that stuff, various tryptamines and, and overall potency and, and things like that. And so I think as that evolves and we get more sophisticated in what we're doing, um, I, I foresee the, the possibility of doing something useful for the community that goes beyond just my variety is really potent and you should buy it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's uh, interesting, I uh, never mind. I won't get into that too, 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 too much. Uh, we're I, I don't want to go down a separate rabbit hole. We're already in our our own Gary rabbit hole at this point. <laughs> um, well, how about you tell us about Telluride, man? I I want to go, and I need you to justify oh, yeah. the expense for me. So the trick is that, well, all right, yeah. So the trick is you want to pay for everything way early <laughs> like mm -hmm. i'm literally getting my airbnb in january okay. but we got a place that was right on main street so it's walking distance from all the venues and it was phenomenal like honestly um one thing that i and my wife and i we kind of decided the last time we went is that we don't want to kind of ruin the magical experience and one of the ways is like if you're vending there, I mean, there's a lot of vendors that have fun too. But for me as a business owner, I'm kind of a consumer when I go to Telluride. Okay. So I wasn't, you know, selling mushrooms or anything. And that way I could just focus on, you know, being in the moment and right. enjoying the experience this year. I got really addicted into foraging. Um, it was a uh, fun. It was a great year. So the first day I was there, I went up the gondola, and um, me and my wife and someone else, we kind of worked our way down the mountain. And it wasn't very long before I had a huge basket of mushrooms. I was like, "Yes, I'm going to take this down to the table," and. We're going to identify all these edible mushrooms and make like a soup or something. And then I just get down there and I'm laying them out. And it's like, I learned them all, but I only remember like three. So it's <laughs> like, it's overwhelming amount of knowledge. But then yeah. you realize like, I don't know anything. So that's at least my takeaway. Like I probably laid out 25 different types of mushrooms and none of them were a choice edible. So it was like very eye opening, but then I did find out, you know, Lactarius deliciosus, and I stumbled on this huge field, and it's this orange mushroom that stains green. So mm -hmm. if you look at it, it does not look appealing, but if you pick them when they're nice and firm and fresh, and I had an opportunity to pick like an entire basket of premium Lactarius and then we went and cooked them up and it was phenomenal. Like it was this mushroom yes. that I had no idea about that I learned and I got to be around experts and people that were in their eighties and they've been going to the mushroom festival every single year. And like, they like, and yeah, the last time I went, they were like, this is the best year in 20 years. And then this time they're like, this is the best year. It's like, it just keeps getting better as far That's as awesome. the abundance of mushrooms. Um, it was very diverse and I found some blue chanterelles, which I didn't even know they existed. I was so upset because we went out for like eight hours looking for golden chanterelles. And I stumbled on these huge piles of these blue chanterelles. And now are, are, is that different than black? I, I love black. Those are one of my favorites. But... I think it's the same. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah they were identified on the table as blue chanterelles, but they look black. So okay. um, either way, they were amazing. 
And in my heart, though, I was just like disappointed because I didn't find the golden ones. <laughs> right. And then we went up the next day and we found a big patch and then we got hailed on. So it was like I was like clutching my chanterelles in the hailstorm. <laughs> but um, that was fun. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, I got to learn a lot, too. So and then some friends of ours had an Airbnb that was right up near the airport. So one of the days we went and had dinner out there and just got to enjoy the views. And it was like 60s and, you know, kind of misty the whole time. So perfect mushroom weather yep. and a break from Denver because, you know, Denver doesn't the temperatures don't really turn until this time of year. So it's like fall, like a preview of fall. And then I came back and was refreshed and I learned a lot and. My goal is to go every single year. Um, we'll see if that happens with a newborn, but it was it was really enjoyable, and I got to meet some of my heroes and hear them talk and just meet the mushroom community, and I love it. So yeah, yeah, it, I, it looks uh, fun. Yeah. I um, I, I think just as uh, the, I, so I've been exposed since being involved in mycology now two years uh, to it. And uh, each year it gets harder to resist because it's like, oh, uh, a giant event full of people who love the same thing I do as much, if not way more than I do. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's what I'm all about. And it's it's in the most beautiful place ever. Like yeah. Telluride is one of my favorite places. It's like so there's Main Street right down the middle is a valley. And then there's probably like four blocks to the south and then four blocks to the north mm -hmm. and then just mountains. And then it goes down Main Street and they changed the, the parade from the last time I went. And it ended up at this outdoor venue and there's like an amphitheater and it just became this huge drum circle and it started nice. raining and it was so tribal and you knew that like every person loved mushrooms. So it was very uplifting and, you know, it's so, such a rare thing to have that tradition in this day and age and seeing some of the greatest mycology instructors and enthusiasts and, I was kind of sad that Paul Stamets wasn't there, but you know, there's lots of other well-known mycologists and, you know, just being surrounded by those people. It's uh, yeah, it's something yeah, it's inspirational, man. That's yeah. what, uh, that, I mean, I'm an enthusiastic dude anyway, but uh, being around other enthusiastic people just is like, you know those little cars you had as a kid where like you would make them go and then the wheels would wind up and like rrr, 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 and you just set it down and just launch. Yep. That's I'm that's pretty much going to be me. Yeah. That that's it and uh yeah. Next year let's uh let's let's do it. Oh cool, man. We're going <laughs> to we're going to get a big old like sub meetup going. Yeah. Yes, we need to do that. Um I grew up in Michigan and there is quite like a old school foraging vibe there i mean there's a lot of morels and uh there's that's like in the culture to go uh hunting for morels every year and i knew several people one uh one relative who was quite knowledgeable but he knew guys who were i mean exhaustive knowledge of mushroom species and not just mushrooms but uh you know kind of like um crime pays but botany doesn't guy i forget his name um but like they could just look at every fucking thing in the woods and tell you what it was and you're like how do you do that and you're like yeah. you're the guy that works at meyer yeah like, i don't get it but i i celebrate that because in our world of like over credentialization where it's all about i mean i i work in healthcare it's all about how many letter acronyms you have after your name <laughs> and all that right it's just like <laughs> abc dfg hij klmnlp oh he must be important <laughs> like yeah i'm over that shit because that is not where knowledge originally came from that's not like the old ways like you could just have knowledge and it, it wasn't um 
as um, Mike Denver just brought up, you know, it's not, uh, there's no gatekeeping by, by economic status. You know, you, you can go in the woods and you can learn about things and you can go to a library and look up what the name of something is. And I have, so you saying that there's like some 80 year old guy that knows every mushroom, that's the guy I want to go meet. Yeah, it's like, absolutely those people. It's amazing and it's humbling, but it's also like you can see that person and be like, I can strive to become that or better yeah. than them or, you know, just in your own way. How do you leverage your own skills to contribute to the festival? Because yeah, I mean, I always yeah. look at it. That's how I look at everything. And I know you do, too. You've literally said it is. How do you. OK, I'm a part of this community. What the fuck are you going to do for it? Yes. Do something for it. Yeah. I mean, there's people that just bring positive energy. Right. And then there's people that know how to cook. And then there's people that, you know, know how to organize. And then there's right. people that are, you know, just being there for the spirit of the event. And then there's people that have been there every year. So there's like this yep. huge conglomerate ball of energy and, yeah, I mean, I love it. It goes by too fast, but it makes it special. And um, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to go and just share my experiences. And I create, I did so much GoPro footage, but it's terrible. <laughs> like I was learning my like gimbal and like right. in the meantime, I was just like throwing it away to go hunt mushrooms. <laughs> just, like, But I meant to like make this really nice video, but want to know so if anyone knows uh, Malama Mushrooms, they have uh, an Instagram reel, which is like the ultimate procurement of the Telluride Mushroom Festival. So shout out to them because... Wait, how, so I, how do you spell that? It's L-M-A-L-A-M-A, -A -A, Malama, I believe. Okay. And they're, they're from Hawaii. Um and they sell like llama like, llama red pajama, which you'll be reading every night for years. Trust me, Gary, <laughs> you will be, All right. I will send you, uh, when we meet up next year, uh, I'll send you, uh, I'll bring you a bunch of children's books. All right. Yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot of wisdom in those books, Gary. There, yeah. I'm telling you. Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. Well, you got me, you got me sold. I mean, I think I was pretty much sold. I just, uh, it, it's a, it's a little pricey. Um, but of course, like everything, when you really start doing the dollars and cents of it all, uh, it's not easy to put all the stuff together and to bring out the right people costs money. And so, mm -hmm. you know, do you want events like this to keep going or not? If you do, then somebody has got to be paying for these tickets or. Yeah. And I also saw there was like a Myco fest by, William Padilla Brown. Which oh, that's yeah. He's gaining. doing uh, some cool stuff out in Pennsylvania, not too yeah, far from me. So that's yeah. gaining traction. I think that there could be like some sort of event that's more in Denver and not as secluded. That's more of like a convention or what Oakland Hyphy is putting on is really yeah. cool. Like the psilocybin cup or whatever they're doing over there. It's gathering a lot of people yeah. and cool. So it's like. Yeah. So I, I think there's think. still a lot of opportunity for, I mean, in this community, there's got to be people who have that background um, and are really quality organizers, event coordinators and organizers. And it would be great to see those people come out of the woodwork and, and reach out to do more of that. Um, definitely what William's doing is, is great. I mean, I don't know too many people who have the same vision and uh, are so completely overwhelmingly living the quest that they are on as that dude he, he's pretty awesome one day i might be lucky enough to get to sit down and talk to him a little bit but yeah he's he exudes on every level like no matter how good your game is you're like but you know what william is 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 on a whole nother level so he he's one of those very inspirational dudes uh Hopefully yeah, and his, he his was Michael actually Fest. at the at the Telluride Fest. Of course he was, man. He's everywhere, grateful. dude. Yeah, yeah. Super he's grateful good. for him. He's and... Everywhere, he's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Hats off to him. Yeah, 
Yeah, speaking of hats, I like that hat. I oh yeah, I, thank you. Uh, I might need to get one of those. I'm we got to uh, restock. We sold out, or I just gave too many of them away. <laughs> That's honestly what happened. But um, yeah, we'll be re-upping for the for the holiday season. Great. But yeah, I'd love um, one of those uh, those Michael Geeky hats too. Yeah, dude. Uh, well, you know, I like this hat. It, um, it's not fancy like yours, so this is just it's through Printful. Um, yeah. But honestly, compared to some of the the shirts, are all right. They're they're okay. They're not amazing. They're definitely not as cool as the shirt. Um, but the hat is nice. Um, the hat is pretty nice quality. I just did a one off from another company to see if the quality was that much different to justify mm -hmm. using the this other slightly more expensive company we'll see but man it's just you know sometimes people want to be at a, a affordable price point so i've i've been really doing the merch more just so people got something to show their pride and stuff like that which is Absolutely. what that's all about um i make one thing and i make it well and it's not hats so <laughs> yeah i'm not a sewer I tried. So I was a furniture maker and I thought, well, if I'm really going to be a furniture maker, I must become an upholsterer. So I, I took two upholstery classes from some master upholsterers. And uh, at the end of the second class, the, the guy concluded, he goes, this is just not for you. You do not have the knack. He goes, I've seen your furniture. You're an amazing furniture maker. But this, this, you do not have the knack for it. He goes, you will need many years of practice. And I was like, yeah, okay. I'm not going to do this. I, I'm already devoting too much time to mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's just that. So it's all good. All right, dude. Well, we've done this for a hot second here. And uh, I don't know about you. I'm a, I'm rounding up to about 1130. I know it's a little bit earlier there for you. 930. That's yeah. It yeah flew I mean, you by, still got you still got time to watch the new Dahmer series on Netflix or, um, you know, you can watch, uh, I like watching fantastic fungi for like the 80th time with my children. Um, and then I get to hear my wife say, are you watching that again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Miss geeky. I am watching that again. I'm sorry. Yeah. I got my, uh, my podcast that I listen to and, um, I don't know, not too much TV these days, although I would like to get to that Lord of the Rings series. I've heard mixed things about it, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just saving it for for uh, the down season. That's usually when I get my TV in. Right. Well, well, yeah, just wait till you have a kid watching a uh, little kid show, you know, uh, Paw Patrol and uh, Bubble Guppies and, oh, dude, get ready. Oh man, you're you're gonna relive your whole life again. That's I mean that's really the joy of children is you relive all that stuff and and they make you feel really intelligent because they come up to you and say things like, "How do you tie your shoe, Dad?" And you're like, "You don't know how to tie your shoe? Come here, let me show you. I know how to tie the best shoes." So awesome. Yeah, well, they, I'm looking forward fun. to it. It's gonna be a new chapter, but yeah, I'll uh. I'll be hitting you up for some some dad advice. Oh, it's easy. You just they they're hard to kill, and uh, they pretty much you know they <laughs> they raise themselves. Yeah, the Have only you thing heard I can the, uh, the Merlin like little jacket things. Oh, are you infant. talking about like a little like to to swaddle them? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm all about the swaddle, dude. All right. I, I'm a swaddle pro. All right, I can do a tech I, video for you on the swaddling. Don't you worry. That, that's the uh, the number one advice I've had so far. Is yeah. like there's a book called the, the Happiest Baby on the Block. I think it's called. Read that book. That's the only book you need to read. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, and the other thing is when they ask you for a phone, say no. And when they ask you for Snapchat, say no. Because the minute right. you say yes to that, it's all over, dude. They won't care about you anymore. They're just Snapchatting their life away. Yeah, the next version of TikTok is going to be scary. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, if um if you're interested in the psychology around it, so you know B.F. Skinner, his original Skinner box experiments. Um, there's a book called The Skinner Box Effect, and it's all about how all the internet has become is a big Skinner box for us, right? And we're no better than those mice. We 
we will sit just like that old lady chain smoking her cigarette in Vegas. <laughs> Come on, give it to grandma, right? Like for literally days and days and days hoping to hit it. We're the same way, man, right? We got to keep scrolling. You ever just scrolled and been like, why am I still, why can't I stop scrolling? Cause you're just hoping for that one miniature dopamine hit of like some cool picture from fresh from the farm fungi. Oh, there I go. I got yeah. it. Okay, now I can get off. As long as it's mushrooms and yep. maybe this conversation will break that cycle. Hopefully. Yeah. You saw uh, Adobe just did a little study on content creators and they said, while content consumers are overwhelmingly not terribly happy, content creators are overwhelmingly happy because that's such a positive feedback loop, right? Like you're, you're getting all, you're like, wow, I'm making content and people appreciate it. And they're telling me every day that, that, that it's valuable to them. And yeah, so absolutely. It, it's well, great. I appreciate this conversation and to everyone out there listening, I hope I uh, explained my story well. And if you ever have any questions, shoot me an email or I'm trying to keep up with all my, my comments on YouTube and stuff and it's getting overwhelming, but I try my best. Like I'll be up at like three in the morning, like try to answer every question. And I don't know how much longer I can do that, but um, I'm trying my best and I love the feedback and I love the community and I'm sure we'll have another conversation oh, at yeah. some point when the building's all up and, uh, Oh yeah. We're going to need a tour, yeah. man. I might have to come out. We might have to do a live broadcast yeah, we'll, out there. We'll camp out camp out on the land and uh yeah before before tell your ride you can swing by there you go perfect all right cool well, man well thank you so much and to everybody watching um if you don't know how to get a hold or interface with uh gary and his uh all his cool stuff it'll be in the description uh below uh the youtube uh video so cool. anyway thanks everybody uh we'll see you next week um, oh, no, we won't. What is next week? Oh, it's my birthday coming up. So I, I'm taking the, the week off. Uh, my birth mom's coming into town and we're going to hang out a little bit. So one week off for the geeky and then we'll be we'll be back at it after that. So anyway, peace cool. out, guys. I look forward to those future episodes. Oh, yeah. <laughs>